Alright, so today we're going to continue looking at the basics of an Android application and start getting to cases where there's actually code. Right now the code that we've seen has been minimal, right? We've, we've seen code in our Java class that simply displays the main layout and that's it. And the main layout had an image on it or text or something else and other than that it wasn't too earth shattering but we've seen the parts of the layout and we've seen the parts the files that go into creating an Android app uh, don't be don't be disturbed if some of the details are still hazy about like what you put in a layout or how you code a layout, or what this property means, or what that property means. That'll come with time. For now, just be sure that we can locate stuff in the app and point to the files and say what those files mean. Like we have our files that have constants in them. Whether they relate to color, or layout, or um, strings, we have those XML files. We have an XML file for layout that controls the way the screen looks. And then we finally have a Java class which kind of controls everything and runs everything. So we're going to start out this week looking at a tip calculator, a simpler version than the tip calculator that Deedle has. So let me bring that up. You can download that from Canvas. Um, if you have difficulty getting the Deedle to tip calculator to work, use this tip calculator. Use any application you want. Go in and create a Hello World application and use that. Um, it benefits you to learn how to get the detail, the Deedle applications imported. So that's something you should still continue to work on and figure out. But for now, the important thing is, you know, that you understand the different parts and you can navigate around that. So I'm going to go into open up Android Studio. open an existing Android Studio project. I have saved on my desktop uh, the tip calculator. That's my tip calculator, not the um, D to one. So let's go open that. Open it. It loads it in the window. What do you have here? Is that... Pardon me? Your tip it's under uh, probably week two module. Okay. And let's go in and we'll spend a minute reviewing all the stuff that we saw in the other application. Applications. And then we'll, we'll drill time down into it. First of all, we have resource files that contain drawables. In this case, we don't really have any images. Uh, we have our layout activity. We have our values. Strings, styles, colors, and so on. Again, the big advantage of this is that we can put everything in one place. It's hard uh, instead of hard coding it, whereas we'd have to change it throughout the app. There's one place where it's coded, and we refer to these constants throughout our application. These are all called resource files. We talked about that last time, and we saw an example where 
we're able to actually use a different resource file in, in different situations. And the one that we used is we used uh, a language resource file. So I created a second strings XML file and I gave it the resource qualifier of language of Spanish. When I changed my virtual device's language to Spanish, it then used that for the constants. So it's great that you can put all these codes in one place and you can change them and it's changed throughout the app. It's also good that under different circumstances you can plug in and plug out these different resource files. And again, language is just one of them. Screen size, screen density, all those things come into play when we are creating uh, an application. We can give resource qualifiers. There's a whole list of them. There's a lot of ways that we can say, hey, under this circumstances, use this file instead. Which is good because Android devices, there's, there's a world of Android devices. Uh, in some respects, developing for an Android can be trickier than developing for in the iOS world because the iOS, there's only a limited amount of hardware. You know, there's a certain, there, there's iPads, there's an iPad mini, there's iPhones, different versions of them, but nothing compared to the breadth of things that you find in the Android world. So, resource files, our layout file, we're using a linear layout. Linear layout is one of the simpler layouts, probably a good idea to use going forward for your first view anyhow. That's where you simply have your controls stacked in a line. They can either be oriented vertically or horizontally. In this case, it's oriented vertically. What do we have? We have a text view, an edit text field, a spinner control, a spinner control being like a drop down where you choose between a list of options, and then finally a button. So let's notice something here. Text view, the width is to fill parent, so we'll make it as wide as it, the parent container, container is. The height is wrap content, so we'll make it as tall as it needs to be. The text size is 30 SP. We'll talk about the units of measure, um, maybe not today, but uh, in future, future classes. And the Android text comes from at string, the field called hello. Edit text is a different kind of control. It's a control that allows you to actually enter text into the field, as opposed to simply displaying text. This has an ID. So we're saying add to the list of IDs AMT for this field. That is critical because we are going to write code to access this. This is a tip calculator. It's going to take the value that we enter and a rating of the service, whether it was good service, bad service, or excellent service. It's going to do a computation and it's going to display the result. So we need the values from this edit text field to do the calculation and to do our thing. In order to get the values, we need to be able to point to that. And that's why it has an ID. Again, this one doesn't have an ID because it's simply displaying text. It's displaying, I don't know, enter amount or something like that, or the hello, the greeting. All right? So we're not going to write any code to address that field and to access it or manipulate it. So we don't have any ID for it. We do have an ID for this one because we're going to use our code to manipulate it. Does the plus indicate, what does the plus indicate in front of the ID? The plus indicates that we are adding this ID to the list of IDs. Okay. Because it's not there now, so add it there. It's a new ID. Spinner control is the same thing. All right. Um, it has an ID for service. One difference between this is the entries come in the strings constant file, but 
they're in an array. Poor, average, and excellent. So a string field is for a string, a single string. A string array field is for an array of strings. So in this case, for our layout, we have poor, average, and excellent. Remember, I kind of panicked last time, thinking that I wasn't using a string file. But sometimes it shows you the completed text. And if you hover over it, it shows you the text field that it belongs to, or if you click on it. The difference being is when I was hovering over it, the background was kind of a, a little bit different. But don't panic if you see text there instead of referring to the string file because the IDE does that to display it to you just so that you don't have to refer back and forth. I frankly don't like that, uh, but I guess it's kind of convenient. So this is what this is going to look like. Linear layout. So the controls are going to be in a line. They're going to be stacked vertically because the orientation of the linear layout is vertical. It's going to be a text view on top of an edit text view on top of a spinner control on top of a button. So let's run this and just make sure that we understand the way the layout, the layout looks. We're not going to worry about the code quite yet, but we're going to run this and make sure that we can see the layout. Sometimes it gives you an error if you uninstall the application. That's what I'm doing now. Uninstalling it. And let's try to run it again. Okay. And there's our simple tip, tip calculator. Remember, this bar up here is the application name that's built into the framework. That's not something that we see as being in our layout. What did I say was on our layout? We had a text area. Let's pull this up. We had a text view. It's a simple text calculator. We have an edit text field. That's for us to enter the dollar amount. We have a spinner control that's like a drop down where you can choose between several different options. And then finally we have a button to go ahead and do the calculation. Oh, and we have one more thing. I forgot. We have a text view at the bottom to actually calculate the tip and display the tip. So make sure we understand how we get here in the layout was defined by these controls that are in our linear layout. Because it's linear, they're stacked vertical, right on top of each other. Well, because they're linear and the orientation is vertical, they're stacked vertically on top of each other. If you notice, the 
cursor went right into the text field to enter the amount in. That's because I have the request focus uh, tag right there. Okay. So I can go and I can put, say, our bill was $100. We had average service. Calculates the tip at 15%. We have poor service. We pay $10 tip. We had excellent service. We pay $20. All right. Questions about what we've seen so far. What I expect you should know is this. Number one, the fact that the string literals come from that string file, which we could put a resource qualifier on and make a different version for a different language. We could put a resource qualifier and make a different version for uh, if the screen was hori uh, oriented horizontally versus vertically, if it was a large screen, like a tablet, we could put resource qualifiers to say use this string file under these particular conditions. But we don't. This is a simple example. We just have one strings file. The layout, we saw the layout. Linear layout, again, means they're going to be stacked. Text view is to display a text. Edit text is to enter text. Notice also we could put an input type of number. That's when we went to go and run it. We didn't get the full keyboard to type in letters and numbers, given the fact that um, you can only enter in a, you should only be able to enter in numbers in that field. A spinner control, which is associated with an array because it has a list of options instead of a single option. The prompt is a, spray, is a string. And then finally we have a button and we have a text for the result. Layout height and width, wrap content means make it as big as the content is. So if we see on the, well, the text view for the result, the text view is that big because that's as big as it needs to be. I don't think you can leave a blank. Uh, the other thing is to fill, is fill parent. And that will make it like, do we have any fill parents here? Yeah, the drop down says fill parent. So it goes across the width of the screen. If you don't have something in the XML file that's required, it will tell you. All right. So we made this layout very simple. Uh, there's a lot of options that you can do in layout, and I'm not going to consider all those options right off the bat. We're going to keep things, we're going to try to keep things simple, do a simple layout, because I think the coding and understanding how things are connected is our first task to get done and to understand that. Notice again, some of the things have IDs, some of the things don't. Well, actually, everything has an ID except this one, the text view at the top of the page, because we don't do anything with that, right? We, our code isn't going to touch that text field. It simply displays the word simple text calculator, and there you go. Whereas this, if you think about it, we need to know this to do the calculation. We need to know this to determine the level of service so that we can translate that into a percentage. We need this because we need to know that it got clicked. All right? So we need to be able to point to this and say, hey, when you're clicked, I want you to do something. And then finally, we need this because this is where we put the answer in. Okay? So all of those have IDs because our code needs to reference those. All right, let's look at the code. And there's, there's a couple of key concepts that I'm going to try to get across today. All right. One of them is a concept of a listener. All right. What does what does the word listener? What does that sound like to you? I'll give you a hint. A listener is an object in your code. What does it seem like a listener would do in this program? Wait for input. Wait for input. 
Okay, that's, that's a good start. It waits for something to happen, definitely, to something. It's a signal to kind of start the interaction. Because if I don't do anything at the screen, nothing happens, right? I haven't touched that screen, so there, so nothing happened. Something's waiting for something to happen, though, right? Uh, what is this code waiting to happen? It's waiting for the button to be clicked. Right. Now, we could have listeners on any number of different controls, but in this case we only have one listener, and we have the listener on the button. That's why I chose to do this one instead of the Dito example. The Dito has several listeners, and I think that can be a little confusing at first. So we're going to keep this simple. We just have one listener. So we have an object whose job it is, who is associated with that button, who's tied to that button, and it's waiting for something to happen to that button. And what happens to buttons? They get clicked, right? So it's waiting for the button to get clicked. When the button gets clicked, that's a signal to go and do something. All right? So, listener. Second thing we're going to talk about is an interface. And by interface, I don't mean like a GUI, like a graphical user interface. I mean interface in the Java sense, or C-sharp sense of the word. Does anyone recall from taking Java what an interface is? Yes? It's a, uh, it means for the programmer to um, implement multiple inheritance. That's true. You can, uh, you have a bunch of abstract methods, and then you go ahead in your regular classes and um, implement their own. That's true. That's true. Um, when you have inheritance, we say that this class is a that class. When we implement an interface, what are we saying? If, if class A implements class B, what what are we saying in words? That you are implementing all of the methods, all of the um, constants and methods indicated in the uh, interface. In any interface. You're absolutely right. You're implementing, if, if we say A implements interface B, we're saying that there is in A an implementation of all B's methods. By definition, those methods are abstract methods, right? Because you can't declare a concrete method on an interface. You can only declare abstract methods. So by definition, they're abstract methods, and if you implement that interface, you've promised to implement those methods. Okay, so that's absolutely right. In English language terms, if I said A implements B, what am I what am I saying? A has B or has a version of B. Uh, maybe. That's, that's, a, that's a good start. Anyone care to change that? A, you're saying A implements B. A implements B. Then everything in B, uh, everything in A is also represented in that's not a good way to say it. Every, everything in B is, has okay. to be indicated in That's true. That's true. Let's, let's try to make it more concrete. Because you guys are doing a really good job thinking as programmers and given the Java definition of that. Let's think in more uh, real-life terms. We'll talk about different kinds of interface. But it's still, it's still an interface, and it's an interface like a Java interface is. Oh, here it is. This implements the USB interface, correct? Not in software terms, but in hard, well, maybe in software terms, but this implements the USB interface. What does that mean? This has all of the characteristics of the USB interface okay. and something unique of its own. Okay. On a very practical level, what does this mean? Yeah, it means I could plug it into a USB port and it'll work. 
more or less. All right, I know that's an approximate uh, approximation, but I can plug it in and it will work. So wherever there's a USB port, I can plug this guy in. That what it, that's what it means when you implement an interface. It means wherever one of these is called for, I can use it. Boom. I can plug it in. All right. I can plug it in wherever I need it. So software interfaces are like that too. Wherever a listener is required, I can plug in any class that implements that listener is our particular challenge. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at our code. This is our, that's the wrong thing, this guy, main activity. Let's look at this line right up here. This class is my main activity. We've seen main activity classes before, right? We saw it in the welcome application. We saw it in the hello world application. There wasn't much in it, right? But we said an, uh, an activity is essentially a screen that you're going to pop up for the user that the user could do something with it. Now, the user couldn't do much with our earlier ones. They just look at them. But the user could do something with it. In this case, the user could go and calculate a tip. So our, this is our main activity class, no different than what we've had before. And we're going to see some of the same code. Like these two lines were the only lines in the activities that we looked at last week. To call the ancestors on create and to set the activities main content view. All right, to whatever our XML file was. But notice what this does. This also implements the class view on click listener. Okay? View on click listener. So what does that mean? That means that I can also use this class to be someone's on click listener. Well, no sense like being, you know, uh, evasive about it. It's going to be the buttons on click listener, right? It can be, I could plug it into that button because I've implemented that interface. All right? This class is not just an activity. It also implements the on click listener class which means anywhere that I need an on-click listener, I can use this class if I want to. So, what methods do you suspect are, gonna, are, are part of the on-click listener interface? To call the method that's doing the calculation in your case. Okay, what do you suppose a method is on an on-click listener? When you click it. When you click it. So... What do you think the method's name is going to be? On click. On click. Right. And if you want to see if there's any more methods, we can Google it. It's beneficial if you get used to using Java Docs. So we can look at Android. Google Android. View on click listener. And we can get this documentation and this tells you what exists there's only one method on, on an on click listener and that is as we predicted on click all right No, this is part of the Android framework. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is this is a class that's built in Android, the view dot on click listener. Okay, so let's look here. Sure enough, if we look through this class, here we go. Click, which
which means that this class can serve the role of an on-click listener. All right? If I took that out, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm not going to really delete it. I'm just going to change the name to something else. I try to compile it, what's going to happen? It's not going to be good news. Why not? Because main activity is, is not abstract and does not override abstract method on click in, in on click listener. So, in other words, we promise that this guy's an on click listener. We promise that it's going to implement that interface. And yet, we didn't supply the one function that we need to in order to make this an on click listener. And that is the on click event. We change that name back to on click, and we're good to go. There we are. We're running. Okay. So let's not worry about exactly what this is doing right now. But we know that it has an on-click method. So it's valid to be an on-click listener for that button. So let's look at the rest of onCreate. All right. OnCreate says button calc. We've seen these two instructions before, so I'm not going to talk about them. Button calc equals button find view by ID r.id.calc. This is like a real important function, and we're going to use it like in everything we write. Find view by ID. Those of you that have done maybe JavaScript, does that remind you of any function? Find view by ID. Get element, Get element by ID. And it serves the exact same purpose. What this says is find the thing within our layout that has an ID r.id.calc. Well, let me remind you, what has the ID of RID calc? Our button does. R for resource, ID, calc. So what that line says is find the thing on our layout that has the ID of calc. And we're going to store it in a variable called calc. Now, I wouldn't have to store it in a variable called calc. I could have called it x, but it helps, me, it helps to name things in a consistent manner, in a clear manner. Now, let me tell you the result of this statement. And then we'll look at the exact syntax of the statement. All right? Because it's important. Like, let's not put the cart before the horse. Let's make sure we understand when this statement is done what we have. And then let's look at the statement and break it down piece by piece by piece so that we understand how we got there. When we are done, we have a object reference pointer, a variable that points to an object, named count. And that calc is pointing to a button, right? Because we declared it as a button. And it's pointing to the thing in our layout that has the ID of calc. So when we're done with this, the variable calc points to this button. So if I say calc something, I'll point to that button. If I call a method on the object calc, I'm calling a method on that button. So yeah, I could change the text if I wanted to. I could probably change the background color if I wanted to. I could change anything about that because now I have a pointer to it. And that's exactly why we need an ID, right? Without the ID, we couldn't point to that button, at least not very easily. So OK, so calc is a variable that points to that button. 
So count points to that button. Let's, I'm going to write these instructions on the board and we'll, we'll analyze it step by step by step so that you understand it. Because we're going to do this like all the time and we, under, we need to understand it. So. Actually, I'm going to try to keep this up on the board as I, as I uh, explain this. So when this runs, it does this. It sets the content view. What does that do that actually brings to life that XML layout? And it creates objects for all the things on the layout. What are the things on the layout? Well, we saw them. Text, area, enter text field, spinner control, button, and another text area. So, this is our layout XML file. And it has a text view, edit text, spinner, button, that by the way has an ID of calc, and another text view. When we execute, this statement, set content view, that brings up that layout in our device. Effectively what it does is it takes this layout XML file and actually creates on the heap different objects. Text view object maybe at this location in memory. An edit text object, maybe at this location. A spinner, maybe at this location. I'm just writing the numbers 10, 100, 200, 300, I'm just making them up, though I'm sure those are not correct. The button maybe is at this location. And then finally, the text on the bottom is this location. All right, so that's what this statement does. It says, okay, go take that layout that's simply like a layout of the kind of objects that we're going to get and make those real objects in the Java Virtual Machines heap. So it makes those out on the heap. Makes all those objects. So now I have this statement. Button calc. What am I doing there? I'm defining a object reference pointer named calc. And it's going to be pointing to a button object. Right? In Java class, we may have done something like this. String name. Right? Or customer C. Right? Student S. Well, here we have button calc. It means on the stack, we're creating a variable somewhere in the stack at some location that's going to hold a reference to a button.
That's what this statement does. Of all the objects that exist in the view, find the one that has an ID of calc. That's our button. What does this do? It casts it as a button. What does that mean? Find view by ID. Notice that says find view by ID. We can use this to find a text field, an enter text field, a spinner control. We use the same find view by ID no matter what kind of view we're looking for. Right? We use it if we're looking for buttons, spinners, enter text fields, whatever. So if, therefore, this function is going to return a view. Now, if you remember from Java class, we can't create a pointer for the subclass and put a member of the superclass in it. We can do the opposite, right? I could put a button in a variable defined to hold a view. But I can't put a view defined in a field that's defined to hold a button. In other words, find view by ID doesn't know in advance what kind of view it's going to return. I know what view it's going to return because I wrote the program, right? So I know it's a button, so I can like whisper, hey, by the way, that's going to be a button. Yes. Where does it do that? Um, it'll like gray that out. I don't know why it is for you. But okay. It's for me. Well, you you you'll have to show me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not not really not really sure why that would be. So the bottom line is, when we're done, we're going to have that button, the pointer to it, in this variable. Variable count. So calc is going to point to that button. Now, we're going to do one more instruction today, and then we will finish up this example next time. The last instruction says calc set on click listener to this. All right, let's make sure we understand what that means. Calc is what? What is calc? Exactly. Calc is a button that we just pointed to. So calc is this button on the screen. There's a method on buttons called set on click listener. Makes sense, right? What does that do? Well, that says what class, what, what object, rather, is going to handle the clicking of this button. What object is going to have the code that handles what gets done when this button gets clicked? We set that. What do we set it to? We're setting it to this object. This activity object, which, yes, by the way, also implements the on-click listener. So, in this case, what we're saying is this object contains the code that happens when we click this button. Where is that code found? Of course, it's found in the onClick method. This is what ties that button to the piece of code that's going to handle the clicking of it. Set onClick listener. And in this case, the onClick listener is in the same class with the activity. The onClick listener is the activity. We've just combined everything into one class just to make it simpler, a little more straightforward. You don't have to do that. There's other ways that you can create a listener and associate with an object. 
But when you have a very simple application, yeah, why not? Make the click listener the same as the activity. You just have to add the one on click method. We point to the button by using the ID, and then we set the on click listener to be this class. That means this is a code that's going to run when that button gets clicked. And next time, we'll go over exactly what that button does, what code happens in that button. So next time, we'll spend a little bit of time reviewing this. I'll play a few what if questions, like what happens if I delete this function? What happens if I... I don't know, change the name of this. We'll just we'll play around and we'll see if we can guess what happens. Then we'll go in and we'll look at the actual code in the onClick method. Any questions at this point? All right. Um, if you, let, let's review the way that I want the grading to work. All right. When you're done, upload it to Canvas and then call me over and I can grade. Call me over and show me what you have or I guess I can download it from Canvas but it takes two steps. You have to upload it to Canvas then you have to draw, my, you know, get my attention in lab so I can take at it review with it. Um, again, this lab is not due until tomorrow so you still have time to work on it. And I'm planning on doing most of the grading on Thursday, but if you happen to finish early, I'll be glad to look at your code, or no, not actually not code, but screen prints uh, in lab. All right, that's all I had. I will go unlock the lab, and then I will come back and do what? Oh, grab my files and grab my stuff, then I'll be back in.